Okay, well, uh, let's go ahead and get rolling for today. So, a couple of announcements. It's good that the projector is working today. I'm happy about that. So, uh, on Friday, I, of course, had to do the Chalk Talk, but I found a recording um, from last semester, not last semester, but last spring, uh, which covers essentially the same thing that I talked about on Friday. I went ahead and posted that uh, on Canvas. So if you had a hard time taking notes or something like that, go ahead and listen to that. Um, it's essentially equivalent uh, information. Um, so look at that. Um, recitation sections. Uh, I made an announcement this morning about recitation sections on Canvas. Make sure you look at that announcement on Canvas. I'm going to go ahead and say what times those are going to meet. Um, and, uh, but again, look on Canvas. So um, Zach, uh, we have two Zachs. Uh, Zach Hazlitt is actually going to do his on Thursday from 4 to 5 in Walnut 103. So Thursday is 4 to 5 for Walnut 103. Um, the other Zach is going to do his on Fridays from 5 to 6 in Walnut 103. Um, and then finally, Ben is going to do his on Sundays from 5 to 6. It says in Walnut 103 on Canvas, but we changed that to MRB 312 because the building Walnut 10, uh, 103 will be locked. So we're going to do that MRB 312, okay? Um, so uh, there are, of course, there's always... Um, exceptions to the rule and unfortunately the two exceptions for the recitation sessions happened in the very first week. Uh, the, the first one would be Ben's uh, from 5 to 6, that's right during soup, the Super Bowl um, and attendance may not be as what we would want it to be. So uh, Ben said that he would do it at 3.30, right Ben? 3. Okay, so 3 o'clock, MRB 312. I'll make an announcement on that. Um, on Canvas. Zach, okay, is actually not going to be here, or he has another commitment at 5 o'clock, so he's going to do his at, on Friday from 4.15 to 5, okay? So, um, I'll make those announcements, the differences there, okay, um, on Canvas, so you guys have that in your heads as well, okay? Um, Quizzes one through three are going to be due this Wednesday at 11.59 p.m. So make sure that you get those done. I was just talking to a student outside um, and they said that it was really nice that I had done those review stuff because it had been like three years since they had gone over some of that stuff. So, uh, so remember those um, review tutorials are there for your help. Okay? All right, so our riddle. Four men were in a boat on the lake. The boat turns over and all four men sink to the bottom of the lake, yet not a single man got wet. How is that possible? They're married. Exactly. Not a single, they're all wet, but they're also single. Or, or not single, they're married, right? Not a single man <laughs> got wet. I know. Yeah, they're going to get worse. That's one of the best ones, I'll be honest with you. So um, you got some doozies coming. So uh, anyway, all right. So uh, we left off. You, uh, of course, we were on the board here. We left off right here um, on, uh, when was it? Friday afternoon. And uh, if you remember what we were talking about on Friday, uh, I was trying to illustrate the importance of regulation to maintain steady states. Uh, we cannot maintain a biological steady state without regulation of metabolic pathways. And if we can't do that, then we, the, life wouldn't exist. So this is a very, very important topic and concept and uh, what we did then on Friday was we began talking about just regulation from a very general standpoint and the design of a metabolic pathway, what it would look like um, uh, from a fairly simplistic and general standpoint. Um, and then today what we're going to do is we're going to launch into discussing how regulation can occur, okay? But metabolic pathways are going to consist of two different types of reactions. The ones that are far from equilibrium, what also might be called irreversible steps, and then those are the, uh, that are reversible or near equilibrium steps. Um, and uh, this pathway is illustrating both of those. Uh, one of the things I highlighted for us is that the reversible steps, these guys here, are significantly higher in rate than the irreversible steps. Right? The irreversible steps are what we might be considered rate limiting, and those are typically the steps where we start to see regulation occur. Okay, now, one of the ways that we can then uh, determine where regulation would occur in a metabolic pathway 
is to try and measure what might be considered the flux control coefficient, or C, which I began talking about at the very end of um, lecture on Friday. Uh, now, one of the things, I will say this, I made a mistake, okay, and a student uh, came up to me and talked to me about this afterwards. C should actually equal uh, delta J divided by J and delta E divided by E, okay? Um, so I, I'm not too terribly concerned with your ability to quantitate C. That's not really what I want to go for. What I'm more concerned with is understanding the con concept of what C is and what it means. C values will, will be anywhere between 0 and 1.0 okay, for any enzyme in a metabolic pathway. A C value of 0 means that that enzyme has no impact on the overall flux of the pathway, meaning it is not a regulatory enzyme. These would be enzymes that catalyze steps like these. Okay? They're very high in concentration. They maintain an equilibrium in between the reactants and the products for their particular step. Okay? They can have a C value can also approach 1 or B1, and that would mean that the enzyme is entirely responsible for changing flux, meaning there is only one enzyme in a metabolic pathway that would be regulatory right, at a, if their C value was 1. Okay? That's rarely the case. Uh, at one point in time in biochemistry, we thought that might be the case. That's rarely the case, though, uh, as we realize things with that most metabolic pathways will have multiple points of regulation. Glycolysis is a great example of that, okay? That are one of our first pathways that we'll go over, okay? So um, you will then see C values anywhere between 0 and 1. So we could pull this up, okay, and bring up again, hypothetical C values, all right, and we see this here, C value of 0 0.8 and a C value of 0 0.2 for this last step. Okay. That would seem to indicate that the regulation of this pathway, okay, is by and large determined by that first step, though that last step might have some um, regulatory means in it as well, okay. Now, one of the things that I will say is that C values will always add up, and a metabolic pathway will always add up to 1. You won't exceed that. So it's not like you're going to find a C value of 0.8 and 0.8 for another one. That would be 1.6 and it'd go beyond what you could have for C values. Okay? You could have them equal, C value 0.5 and 0.5, or you know, 0 0.33, 0 0.33, 0 0.33. It just depends on you know, how many steps you have that are regulating. And in those cases, then we would say that there would be equal capacity to regulate a metabolic pathway um, at those steps. All right now, generally speaking, the last thing that I will say here in terms of C value, okay, um, C value, generally speaking, gets higher or larger the less enzyme is that is present, okay, and that would be illustrated in this graph over here. Right, so if you decrease E, and this is how we measure C value, we have some way of determining flux of the entire pathway, A through E, and we then plot that versus changing values of that particular enzyme. We hold all other enzymes in the pathway at a constant concentration. Right, and we then monitor how flux changes. The, lo the, the larger that enzyme becomes in concentration, right, we get out to these values out here in our C values. Okay start to really diminish, okay? whereas down here they are really quite a bit higher. Okay. Right. Now here's what's really, really fun for us for the rest of the semester. Um, we're going to find out that the same pathway can be regulated in very different ways in different tissue types. Um, so, and we'll talk about isoforms of different enzymes that catalyze the same step in particular pathways and that the fact that they are regulated in a much different ways in different tissue types. And so it can become fairly complicated fairly quickly as we consider this. Okay? Now, before we move on past C values, are there any questions on this? Okay. Main point, large C values mean regulatory regulation for that particular enzyme. Okay? All right, now here's what we want to do next. We want to start to think about how can regulation occur at an enzymatic level. 
meaning how are enzymes regulated. And this might be something that you've talked about or touched on in other classes. We have to talk about it here. There are a number of different mechanisms that we're going to encounter in this class that are very important. Okay, let's do this though first. Okay, let me ask you a question. Multiple choice question. Today we are beginning our um, accountability for this. So I'm going to make sure that um, from this point on you're responding and I will hold you accountable for these responses and give you extra credit at the end of the semester. Okay, so um, which type of enzyme is more likely to exhibit higher C values? A michaelis menten type enzyme or a cooperative enzyme? Okay, and this will launch us into a discussion on these two types of enzymes. I'll give you a minute 30, discuss that with your neighbor. What do you think? Okay, and your marks get set, go. What do you think? Oops. So you get about 10 seconds left, so submit an answer if you haven't done so yet. What do you think? All right, three seconds. Okay. Uh, 79 responses. Let's check this out, see what people are saying here. Okay, 63% of you think that uh, michaelis menten enzymes will be more important in regula regulating the pathway than cooperative enzymes. Okay. so. I want to unfold this answer. Some of you might have looked at that and said, wow, I don't remember what a michaelis menten enzyme is. Or some of you might have said, what's a michaelis menten enzyme? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and a cooperative enzyme. So let's do that, right? So, uh, and I hope that this is in the way of a reminder, but maybe it's not. And so it's important that we talk about this. So michaelis menten kinetics, all right, or an enzyme that we would consider a michaelis menten enzyme illustrates what we call michaelis menten kinetics, meaning this. They will have this characteristic hyperbolic saturation profile. Right, this is what you're looking at as a hyperbolic saturation profile. Okay. So I'll just write that down, hyperbolic. Okay. And by saturation profile, what we're doing is we're plotting the rate, velocity of the enzyme versus the substrate concentration of that particular enzyme. Okay, and it illustrates this type of behavior. We can use the michaelis menten equation to fit that behavior. Okay, and what you were looking at over here is the michaelis menten equation. It is not my purpose today to try and pick this thing apart piece by piece. I'm not going to do that. All right, I'm going to mention a couple of things and then we'll move on from there. Let me go ahead and mention this though, and that would be first of all the Vmax, okay? All uh, enzymes will have some theoretical maximum velocity which they can obtain as long as we keep enzyme concentration constant, okay? The Vmax, and I won't derive this or anything like that, I'll just assert it, okay, and just say that this is true. Vmax is equal to kcat times the total concentration of the enzyme. Okay. Kcat is a rate constant. It happens to be the rate constant of the rate limiting step of the reaction. Okay. So at very, very high substrate concentration, the enzyme will essentially be saturated, what we call saturated, 
and it will obtain a rate that is essentially its maximum rate. And it would be entirely a property of that particular enzyme. And the, specifically, that particular enzyme's rate constant of its rate limiting step. That's what will be limiting the entire maximal velocity at that point. Okay? So that's our V max. Now, the other quantity to recognize here would be the Km. And the Km is the substrate concentration at half V max. Okay? So over here we have V max written as this line extending perpendicular from our y axis. Right? Half of that value here, oops, should be half V max. I guess I should, I don't have to write it. That's half V max. And drop that over to our curve, drop it down. This is a substrate concentration, a particular substrate concentration that we call the Km. We will discuss and talk about Km quite a bit in this class. You'll be surprised how much this topic comes up. It's important that we understand what this means, okay? So Km is the amount of substrate required to reach half the maximum velocity, 50%. Okay? In many cases, it's akin to essentially the um, affinity of the enzyme for its substrate how tightly it will bind to it. Um, there are some mathematical differences depending on what enzyme you're talking about. Okay? We can also refer to it as specificity. The specificity of an enzyme for its substrate is another word that you'll hear for it. Okay? Low KM values mean high specificity or high affinity. Large KM values mean weak affinity or weak specificity. Many enzymes, or most enzymes, have a couple of substrates that they will bind to. But they will bind to them with different affinities or different KMs. Okay? We will encounter, for instance, the enzyme hexokinase. That's the first step in the glycolytic pathway. It will have different affinities for fructose and, um, and glucose are the two main substrates. Glucose is really its main substrate. Okay. And we know that based off of its specificity for glucose over that of fructose. Okay? All right. So that's a crash course in michaelis menten enzyme kinetics. Okay. How many of, is this familiar to how many of you? Raise your hand. If, oh, good. Oh, good. Okay, great. So this is a review of that. That's good. Okay, good. Now, let me say this about these. Before we, I mean, we've got that question still kind of hanging out there, okay? So Km, okay? Actually, let's do this. When substrate concentration is much larger than Km, right? So we are talking about way out here, right? The enzyme... rate or velocity will not be sensitive to changes in substrate concentration. Or it won't be as sensitive. And you can see that the curve is flattening out. We could, out there, we could double the substrate concentration and see a very minute change in the rate of the, of the enzyme as a whole. Okay? That will be in contrast to this down here, right, where substrate concentration is quite a bit less than Km. And in this case, the enzyme. will be sensitive to substrate concentration. Or I guess I should say delta changes. Let me erase that, not be so crowded. To changes in substrate concentration. You'll notice down there that 
we could double the substrate concentration down there and it would nearly double the rate. Okay. So having a knowledge of KM, of an enzyme's KM, is very important once we realize and understand what is the substrate concentration for that particular enzyme. Because it tells us whether this enzyme will respond to changes in that substrate concentration and increasing or decreasing its rate. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. It really depends on the enzyme and its KM. Okay? That change in rate based off of substrate availability, availability will dictate whether, how important that particular enzyme, a michaelis menten enzyme, will be in r regulating a particular pathway. Okay? Now, that's michaelis menten enzymes. Questions on michaelis menten enzymes and what I just said. No? Okay, cooperative enzymes. What are cooperative enzymes? Okay, so let's, or a cooperative protein. How many of you recognize that term? Good, this should be a topic you talk about in 401. And some of you have like visions of hemoglobin dancing through your head, right? Okay, so hemoglobin is an example of a cooperative protein. So let me go ahead and just, uh, give you the crash course here. Let's define cooper a cooperative protein. There are cooperative enzymes, of course. And this is a protein in which binding of the substrate at one active site is communicated, quote unquote, to other active sites or another active site. So communication between active sites. Generally speaking, this happens across subunits, okay, quaternary structure though you don't have to have quaternary structure to be cooperative. Usually you do. Okay, so a protein in which binding the substrate at one active site is communicated to the other active site. So let me draw this out here. Oops. And let's just say our enzyme is a dimer and that's its high resolution structure and it's got T stamped in the middle of each of its subunits. Okay, you have to have a super powerful microscope to see the T. Okay, some of you, I heard, I heard one chuckle, that's good, that's good. The rest of you are like, gosh, week two, awesome. Okay, you'll get through it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get through it, you're gonna get through it as well, okay? So we have T, T would be a low state, I should have drawn it consistent with our, here I'll draw it in red be consistent with our diagram over here, our graph. T state's low activity state, okay, of the enzyme or the protein, right? That will be in an equilibrium with the R state. And we'll illustrate circles to indicate that there's been some sort of conformational change. Cooperativity requires conformational changes it requires at least two different either ligand binding sites or active sites, at least two, okay? The communication from one active site to another happens through the conformational change. That's quote unquote the communication, okay? The R state is the higher active state, or higher activity state. Right? Now what you'll notice here is this, okay? I'll come to this, I'll draw this in green. This would really be the graph of the cooperative protein, what I just highlighted here. We would say that it's a sigmoidal saturation profile, not hyperbolic, it has an S-shaped curve. It approaches again a Vmax, okay, all the enzymes do. Conceptually, the Vmax for cooperative proteins or enzymes are the same as the michaelis benton enzyme, okay? It will also have to try and avoid terminology that would be used in michaelis menten kinetics, it'll have uh, something of a measure of a specificity, what we call the K half. This would be half the maximal velocity or half Vmax, again. K half is the, again the concentration of substrate at half Vmax. Yeah. Very similar concept. Mathematically somewhat different, okay. Um, because of the sigmoidal shape curve, but very similar concept, okay? All right. Now, what we see here is this, okay? You'll notice that 
down here at these lower substrate concentration, the enzyme is primarily in the T form, okay? This curve here that's being shown right here, that would be what the enzyme, if we were to lock it in the T state, that's what it would look like. Its kinetic curve would be hyperbolic and it would be low. And so at low substrate concentration is mimicking that. However, there is this point where it starts to break from that behavior and starts to become more R-like until finally we get out to the very end of the curve where primarily R-like behavior is being illustrated. This would be our R state if we were to lock it in the R state. All right. Every point in between is due to this equilibrium between T and R. The substrate okay, in a cooperative protein can induce the conformational change or it can stabilize the R state in most cases. And that's cooperativity. Conformational change, substrate binds, induces a conformational change. We get a more active enzyme and go from there. Yes, question? I just have a question. Yeah. Why you circle at the, the of the rat? Yeah, OK, so the question is, wh why did you do that? <laughs> right? Um, I did that to try and illustrate that at low substrate concentration, right, the, the majority of the enzyme is going to be in the T state. OK? low concentration. I circled it up here to show the opposite, that at high concentrations up, up here, it's going to be mimicking the R state. Okay? Yeah. Other questions? All right, we have yet to really answer our question because the, now you have an idea, what is a michaelis benton enzyme? What is a cooperative enzyme? Which is more important in regulation? Okay? And I mentioned that with michaelis benton enzymes, we talked about the sensitivity at lower substrate concentrations that this will have to changes in substrate concentration. Well, it turns out, let's come to this table, and this is going to get to the answer of our question. Okay? This table okay, is a table that illustrates what's called the Hill coefficient and its relationship to the required change in substrate concentration to increase rate from 10% to 90% of the Vmax. Let me say that again, okay? So the required change in substrate concentration to increase rate from 10% to 90% Vmax. Now, what is the Hill coefficient? The Hill coefficient is a measure of the degree of cooperativity. Okay. A measure of the degree of cooperativity. How well the two subunits or two active sites or more cooperate, quote unquote, cooperate with one another. Okay. The larger the Hill coefficient, the more cooperative the protein is. Okay. So let me do this here. This is no cooperativity. And this is a Michaelis, I'm going to put MM, Michaelis Minton MM enzyme. Okay? And what you're going to notice here is that for a Michaelis Minton enzyme, with no cooperation, Hill coefficient of 1, it takes an 81 fold change in substrate concentration to go from 10 to 90 percent of the maximum velocity for that enzyme. Okay? 81 fold change in substrate concentration is big. That's a big, that's a massive change in a biological organism. Okay? Now, let's just go one down. Give this enzyme some cooperation. A Hill coefficient of 2. Notice what happens here. To go from 10 to 90 percent of the maximum velocity, it only takes a nine-fold change in substrate concentration. These enzymes are significantly more um, sensitive to changes in substrate concentration. And because of that, about 60 percent of you were wrong. 
Right? These are more important in, in um, regulation. They'll have typically higher C values because they're more sensitive to changes in substrate concentration. Okay? So the answer to our question, cooperative enzymes typically have larger C values. Yes? Um, so if one is no cooperativity, then what is 0.5? It, yeah, okay, so the question is, if one is no cooperativity, what is 0.5? That's negative cooperativity, which is rare, but it has been, uh, we have found um, proteins to illustrate it. And I don't know off the top of my head an example of one. I, I mean, I know they exist out there, I just haven't looked. Yeah. yeah. I believe, so, okay, so the question is, is there a range that the Hill coefficient goes up to? I believe that six has been observed, a Hill coefficient of six, which is pretty high. Um, and I, I don't know if there's a, I, I think there is, a, I think that might be a, even a theoretical maximum. I said it observed, but that I think actually is a theoretical maximum, okay? Um, I would have to check six is the number that, that pops into my head. Um, to give you an idea, Hemoglobin, which is a, you know, an example of a cooperative protein, exists in the, between the two and three area. Okay. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. I, I, I don't have anything else to say. Yeah. Right, so let me try and illustrate this from a, a, a regulation standpoint. Okay, looking at, let's see here, yeah, let's, let's look at this curve here. Okay the black one, and let's just say that we have a substrate concentration that's right here, right? So that's our, for some reason, that's the substrate concentration in the cell at that point in time, okay? Well, a fairly small change in substrate concentration, going from here to here, whatever causes that in the cell, again, we're talking about very general terms, whatever causes that in the cell, there would be a fairly significant change in the total rate of the enzyme over that small of a, uh, of a um, change in substrate concentration. That means that this is really sensitive. There are points on the mikhail benton curve that this is like it, but they would have to be modulated by Km. Okay, so generally speaking, these have higher C values. Right. Other questions? Any questions? Thoughts? Concerns? Yes? All these graphs that we talked about are the enzymes at a particular concentration though, right? That's right. We're not, changing. We're not changing enzyme concentration. That's correct. So every single one of these data points in a sigmoidal saturation profile or the hyperbolic saturation profile, enzyme concentration is held constant. Yep. If you were to change it, you, you, it'd be very difficult to graph. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, awesome. Now, cooperative proteins then and michaelis minton enzymes, if they do have C values, they are going to be regulated in a pathway based off of what's called substrate availability. Right? Changes in substrate concentration is what regulates the pathway, right? And uh, we'll extend this now into actually enzymes that are more important than either one of these two in terms of regulation. And that would be, the next one would be, um, Allosteric, so everybody asked that question. Okay, allosteric proteins, okay? Again, you might have hemoglobin dancing around in your head, okay? Because hemoglobin is both cooperative and allosteric. So let's give a definition of allosteric here. Of course, we're going to be thinking about this um, only from a standpoint of, I'm gonna go all the way to here, only from a standpoint of enzymes, not just proteins, but just uh, enzymes mostly, all right? And allosteric, when you think about this, the, the key here would be that there are modulators, okay? Or effectors that will bind at sites other than the active site called a regulatory site. So these bind a regulatory site. And these can either be negative or positive effectors or modulators. Both terms are used in the literature and in textbooks. Okay. Allosteric effectors, allosteric modulators. Negative or positive, they bind at something other than the active site, a regulatory site. Okay. They can lock the enzyme in the T state 
or have it favor the T state, or they can have it favor the R state. Positive regulators will cause it to favor the R state. Negative regulators will cause it to favor the T state. Okay. They will, now, this is the important thing here, or another important thing here. Effectors change velocity or rate at fixed substrate concentration, meaning that they're not being regulated based off of substrate availability. Cooperative proteins is substrate availability. Substrate goes up, the rate goes up, substrate goes down, the rate goes down, those kind of things. You can have a fixed substrate concentration and allosteric proteins, which is really an extension of cooperativity, okay, will change their rate. Okay? And I'm going to illustrate this below. This form of control is really, really, really common and is really rapid. Seconds of time scales. Okay? Because there can be, in a very rapid way, changes in, in the allosteric effectors concentration that can massively change the rate of that enzyme, that can massively change flux through that particular pathway. Right, let me go ahead and, and look at this from this standpoint. Let me draw this line here. Okay. There we go. All right. And I made it too thick. There we go. We'll just do it like this. Okay. There we go. And we're going to do it. That's, we're going to say that's our substrate concentration in the cell a fixed substrate concentration. So pick an enzyme that is a regulatory enzyme that is allosteric, it has some fixed in substrate concentration. Maybe its substrate is glucose or it's, you know, um, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate or something like that, okay? So that's our substrate. We're going to fix it, okay? And there is no allosteric effector at all, okay? And that's what our, our first condition is. This enzyme with no effector, okay? or no modulator, okay, is sitting at 50% of its maximal velocity. Okay. Now, without changing the substrate concentration, an, a positive allosteric effector could be introduced okay, at a certain level. It will bind to this enzyme at a regulatory site and it will cause its activity to go up. And we could go like, let's say here. Notice that the substrate concentration hasn't changed, the effector has, the enzyme's pro um, kinetic properties has changed, and now it's sitting at, let's say, 75% of its Vmax, okay? Simply because a small amount of positive effector has been added. Positive effector. We could do the same thing with a negative effector, come all the way down here, and now it would be sitting at 25% of its Vmax. Okay. So the introduction of these effectors, independent of a change in substrate concentration, can massively change the rate of the enzyme. And then if that enzyme is part of a regulatory step in a, in a pathway, then flux will change. Okay. Very, very important type of regulation. Questions? Yes? Oh, okay, so the question is, why does Vmax um, not change? It actually can. In this case, it doesn't, okay? Um, so in this case, the T, the difference between the T and R state is that the conformational change causes a change in specificity or, or um, affinity for the substrate. There can be, in our examples of enzymes that uh, when their effector binds, they'll actually affect the rate limiting step. They'll make it more efficient or less efficient. So KCAT in that case will change, and that would cause Vmax to change. Okay. That's not illustrated here, but it can be. Yeah. Good question. Yes? Is it common for there to be multiple regulatory sites? Yeah, well, yes. Yes. So the question is, is it common for there to be multiple regulatory sites? Yes. There are going to be multiple regulatory sites, um, and they can be bound by multiple regulators. Okay. It can be really, it can get real complex real fast for a particular enzyme. Yes. Other questions? Okay, I got one question for you to, to kind of drill this home and then we'll, we'll stop on um, talking about allosteric proteins and we'll talk about something else, okay? 
what molecule, let me, let me ask this, okay. Uh, is this unlocked? I'll unlock it. Here we go. What molecule would you predict to be a common allosteric modulator of catabolic pathways? Okay, so this is an example, just a common one. What do you think? Um, what do you think would be a common allosteric modulator of catabolic pathways? Pick a molecule. Think about that. What, why, why would I ask this? Think about that and then talk to your neighbor about it and respond with a text. I've got four responses already. You're doing awesome. I'm going to give you, from this point forward, a minute and 45 seconds. Okay? Go. What do you think? Okay, you got 45 seconds left. So submit an answer. Type it out. What do you think? Okay, 20 seconds. Ten seconds. Five seconds. Coming to the end here. All right. I'm going to cut you off there, okay? Three, two, one, done. Eighty-five results. That's good. Show results. Uh-oh. Um, save changes. There we go. All right, ATP. Insulin, um, actually insulin, so let me say this, insulin is not um, an allosteric modulator. It's a hormone, okay, but it typically doesn't allosterically modulate enzymes. Okay, no idea, please tell me. There it is. Okay, the right answer. I'm joking, that's not the right answer. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, there's some really interesting answers here. A lot of you said ATP, magnesium is an important thing in this, I don't know. Oxygen. Um, Okay, oxygen usually doesn't regulate enzymes, but um, I can see why you'd say that. Okay, um, hemoglobin is a protein itself, not a regulator. So carbohydrates like glucose, okay, um, ligands. That's very general. That's a <laughs> work. Okay, let's see what the most common given answer was here. ATP was the most common given answers. That's actually the one that I was thinking about and hoping that you guys would connect with, okay? So catabolic pathways, are their primary responsibility is to ensure that ATP levels don't drop certain, below certain levels. So ATP and its breakdown products, ADP and AMP, turn out to be really important regulators of most enzymes in catabolic pathways. Allosteric regulators, okay? Um, and we'll illustrate that using carbohydrate metabolism and cellular respiration almost every point along the way ATP can play a role in or ADP and AMP can play a role in regulating those. Okay? So that the cell has a very sensitive way of detecting changes in total energy in the cell. If ATP levels are dropping okay, and its breakdown products are rising ADP and AMP, those ADP and AMP can actually be positive effectors of catabolic pathways meaning that rates then through like glycolysis and these types of pathways will increase fairly drastically in very short uh, amounts of time. Think about it this way. You take off on a sprint, okay? You're gonna need an almost an instantaneous resource of ATP. Right? Because the amount of ATP that you have in your muscle cells will allow you to run at that maximum duration for about two seconds, one to two seconds. After that point in time, you have to have some source of ATP. Okay, uh, and the primary source in that scenario would be the glycolytic pathway. 
that pathway will increase about 81 to 90 fold or 80 to 90 fold um, in a very, very short period of time, primarily because of allosteric effectors of ADP and AMP and a lack of ATP, which actually negatively regulates glycolysis. Okay, all right. So that's connecting it to a more specific example. Obviously, we're talking in, in generalities at this point in time. Okay, questions on those things? NADH can be an important one as well. Citrate import is an important one too. Okay, magnesium. Many of you put magnesium. Magnesium is an important one as too. Okay, so the magnesium, um, you can't hydrolyze ATP without magnesium. Okay, so magnesium can be pretty important in this. Okay, all right. All right, so we got five more minutes. Um, let's go on and talk about other means of regulation. Uh, we won't spend as much time talking about these as we did cooperativity and allosteri. Um, so the, the next one would be covalent modifications. These are really, really, really common. And they can give you a headache really fast, okay? Because lots of enzymes can undergo lots of different modifications in lots of different sites, okay? And we're gonna find out that phosphorylation, at least in this class, is one of the more common means of regulating an enzyme. Okay, phosphorylation simply means the attachment of a phosphate group um, inorganic phosphate to an enzyme, a covalent modification of that. Okay, so what we have down here is an example, phosphorylase B. This is an enzyme we'll talk about later in the glycogen um, um, breakdown pathway. It can be phosphorylated, okay, to make what's called phosphorylase A, right? The enzyme that does this is phosphorylase kinase. Now, it's very important Right? If you learn anything in today's lecture, this is it. Anytime you see sunbeams coming out of, a, out of a box like this, that means it's become active. <laughs> okay. All right. Some of you are like, wait a second, he's about to say, oh shoot, he's just pulling my leg. I'm pulling your leg, okay? I'm pulling your leg. I like to make fun of textbook writers and these types of things. For some reason, sunbeams means active, okay? I don't think sunbeams actually come out of enzymes that are active, but uh, that's the way we illustrate it. All right, so in this case, phosphorylation activated. You'd have to have a phosphatase, okay, to remove those phosphates. So typically for most kinase activities, there's a, a, a reciprocal phosphatase activity, okay? And so kinases and phosphatases become very important enzymes in regulation. Right? Now, we're showing here that phosphorylation activates. Phosphorylation can inhibit as well. So the activity of the phosphatase would then be activating. Okay. It is very context dependent. Okay. Now, here's what's unfortunate about all this. Oftentimes, like phosphorylase kinase will have another regulator that oftentimes is a kinase. So like phosphorylase kinase has to be phosphorylated to become active so that it can activate something else. And if you've taken cell biology and you talked about like signaling pathways, you've recognized this. And then there's like really unfortunate naming <laughs> conventions with it, like MAP kinase pathway, the MAP kinase kinase kinase, that then phosphorylates and activates MAP kinase kinase, which then phosphorylates and activates MAP kinase, which then goes on to phosphorylate other things and activate or inhibit them. I didn't name them. You don't blame me for these types of things when we come across them. It's just what we discover, and then unfortunately, we label them poorly. Okay, and that's an example of that. But anyway, all right, so covalent modification can be very important. Now, let me say this, okay? Acetylation, more, um, certainly more recently, has been illustrated to be more and more common than we realize, and more and more important in regulation of metabolic pathways. Okay, acetylation is the attachment of an acetyl group. Okay. And you'll have a host of, or a family of enzymes that are called acetylases that will do this. And then you'll have a host of enzymes that are called deacetylases that remove that acetyl group. Okay. Again, acetylation can be activating, it can be inhibiting. Okay. Um, so it really just depends. Okay. And then finally, okay, here would be a table or a figure that has other types of covalent modifications that are common and commonly known, okay? 
ADP ribosylation happens to be my favorite because it rolls off the tongue. ADP ribosylation. Okay. All right. So there's a bunch of other ones. Now, I will say this. Um, if you compare this type of control to uh, allosteric, it's usually less rapid. Uh, typically because it usually requires some signaling pathway to activate it. Okay? All right, so we're going to stop there. That's a great place to stop. We'll finish up this on Wednesday. All right, and we will begin uh, lecture two on Wednesday as well.